All right, so now we're going to move on to our question box sermon. And um, the way this is going to work is you were invited to send me questions ahead of the service. A few people did. I'm going to speak to those questions now. If you are in Zoom, I invite you to put questions that you have about Unitarian Universalism, about UUI, about life questions, any semi-appropriate question you can think of. Feel free to put it in the chat now, and we will pick a couple of questions from the chat. And uh, when I finish with the sort of pre-service questions, Mary Beth is going to grab some questions for me, read them from the podium, and then I will respond to them. So uh, to begin with, a very ambitious person sent me a four-part question uh, by email, three of which I will answer today. And the first part of the question was, if the Unitarian Universalist movement were to choose one of the seven or eight principles to be the one thing that all religions on earth can all agree is worth having in their lives and that they could all then work toward implementation and maybe even work together on, which one should it be in my humble opinion and why? So I thought about this um, and there was some discussion at home and there was some dissension at home and uh, ultimately, I was persuaded. Uh, I am going to say uh, the eighth principle, the principle that commits us to anti-racism and anti-oppression from a place of accountable relationship. And the reason uh, that I was brought around to the eighth is because I think that amazing things could happen, amazing things could happen if all the religious bodies in this country committed committed themselves to coming together to undo the evils of racism, of patriarchy, of settler colonialism, and homophobia, and did this by centering the stories, the voices, the needs, and the leadership of the people impacted by these things. That's what the Eighth Principle asks us to do. And that would be dramatic, because religion, I am very sad to say, has not always been a helpful voice on these issues. Sometimes it has been a harmful voice on these issues. So what an amazing thing if that could change. And if nothing else, if that changed many of recent laws, many laws passed just this year that are directed at women or LGBTQ people or the black community that are harmful laws, they would be immediately reversed. And what a beautiful thing that would be. So then the second part of the question was, what specific shortcomings in the Indy metro area do you, in my humble opinion, see holding us back from getting that goal underway towards implementation of that goal? And uh, I see three shortcomings to implementing uh, this anti-racist agenda, anti-oppressive agenda. Uh, the first is lack of resources. And particularly religions tend to see racism as a hearts and minds issue. And they focus on unhardening our hearts. And I want to name that um, all of the religious traditions, or many, certainly most of the religious traditions, um, do, a, do speak to this issue and sometimes speak very powerfully and do lift up the idea that all people are beautiful and worthy of love and try to get us to that place, right? So it's not that religions don't speak to that, and I'm not claiming any uniqueness for Unitarian Universalism in that. But religions tend to stay as a heart and mind kind of issue. And the reality is, if you could wave a magic wand and make every person in this country unracist overnight, it still wouldn't change the fact that the median income of black families is 9% of the median income of white families. And it wouldn't remove lead paint from substandard housing, or toxic chemicals from the soil in poor neighborhoods. They wouldn't relocate power plants and highways. And these things didn't happen by accident. They were the direct result of policy driving the allocation of resources for hundreds of years. And it will take much greater resources than we have ever committed as a nation to reverse that history of harm. So the first lack, uh, the first lack is resources. The second shortcoming is lack of urgency. When you uh, live in a place of privilege, these things can be issues to you, to other people. They are emergencies. They are um, the reality of their everyday life. So the lack of urgency. And the third thing is the lack of relationship. 
Um, when we are isolated, when we are not connected to one another, when we are not talking to one another, when our hearts are not joining, um, that holds us back. And that lack of relationship, again, is not an accident. Um, it happened for reasons that have a lot to do with the same kind of policies that drove redlining and segregation and split our communities into little pieces. So the fourth part of the question was, which of these specific shortcomings might we as a church, as UUI, make a concerted and organized effort to extend our ministry into where we have a reasonable chance for some success, incremental success? And I believe that we could have incremental success on all three of these shortcomings, lack of resources, lack of urgency, lack of relationship. I believe we could have success on all of these by being leaders in the community. And I want to lift up that we have demonstrated just this year with our sustainability initiatives, with our green initiatives, and with the work of our Exodus refugee team, that this congregation is able to do powerful things when it is focused and committed and this congregation is able to make a difference and does make a difference. And in my humble opinion, the place to start if we wanted to make that same kind of difference around issues of racism and other oppressions would be to start with the relationships and begin to build those relationships, relationships with the community around us, with key leaders in the community, and with institutions. And as it happens, <clears throat> uh, you agree with me. Because when the board did their mission and vision work this year, building a relationship with the community was the one thing that came through loud and clear, that there was a real desire to connect to the community around us and the larger community and, and make a difference and be in relationships. So that, you have named that as a priority. I think it is a wonderful priority. I think it is the start of something that could be transformative for the city that we could play a part in. And I look forward to seeing uh, where we take that desire in the coming years. So thank you for that question, um, diligent and thorough emailer. So the second question that I received by email, uh, and this is a, actually I received this question by Slack, so shout out to the Slack people. Um, this is a question that comes up a lot, especially in the last a few years as our nation becomes increasingly polarized. And the question is, as a Unitarian Universalist, uh, there are things, there are people even that I hate. Racism, nationalism, intolerance. Can I hate with love in my heart? And I assume the flip side, can I love with hate in my heart? And, and the answer is um, yes to both. We love and we hate. That is the human condition. Now the kind of love that Unitarian Universalists are called to when we talk about love is not mushy, it's not sentimental, it's not like a Hallmark card, and there's nothing wrong with sentimental love, right? Don't get me wrong, it makes the world go round, but that's not what we're talking about when we talk about love as a religious tradition. We're talking about prophetic love. We're talking about love demanding justice. And love demanding justice, this kind of love is not incompatible with anger, with fury even. Sometimes it demands anger. And if after the events of this week you are feeling anger, that is not inappropriate. That may be your love shining through, right, with urgency and insistency. And prophetic love is capable of saying no to evil and destructive things with total commitment, with total determination, with a burning even in our hearts. No. And we are human. And when we perceive people to be threatening us or threatening our loved ones or threatening our community, it is natural to feel even hate in our hearts. Now the difference between prophetic love and hate is that what hate wants is that the person who threatens us be destroyed, right? Hate wants the destruction of that which threatens us. Prophetic love wants transformation and healing. Transformation and healing, even if for the moment we are in conflict, prophetic love wants transformation and healing. Hate wants obliteration 
Love wants the restoration of wholeness. And it is love that our tradition calls us to. And no one said this is an easy tradition, right? Now, practically speaking, in our daily meditation group, we regularly practice a version of the Buddha's Metta Prayer, where we send kindness and compassion to all people. We visualize ourselves sending kindness and compassion to all people. Uh, Jesus, in his ministry, said, pray for those who persecute you. Practice being able to say a loud and clear prophetic no to that which is evil and that which is destructive without dehumanizing or demonizing the other, remembering that we are all fragile and imperfect beings and we are all someone's child. And it isn't easy, which is why love is something we practice, not something we perfect. We are only human and we do our best. Now, I want to invite Mary Beth to come up to the podium and read a question. Okay, we had a lot of similar questions, um, but this one's different. Will we do more accessibility features, like access, like accessible way to get up to the risers? Thank you. That is a wonderful question, and I want to say first, um, that I appreciate both the noticing involved in that question and I appreciate um, being held accountable by that question. Uh, it is uh, the goal, the intention, and the um, requirement that our congregation be accessible, including the worship space. And there is a noticeable act right now in that these risers are not accessible. Um, and I want to tell you, there are UU ministers in the country who, if we invited them to preach from this sanctuary, they would preach from the floor. They would say, I'm not going to preach behind that pulpit because it is not accessible, right? So there, there, there's that prophetic witness going on in our faith tradition. Um, so the practical answer is I am working with Mara to try and identify and get purchase ramps that will transform this um, pulpit space into uh, an accessible space. So we're working on it. Uh, it takes a little while to get anything in this currently supply chain disrupted reality. Um, but if you wanna talk about uh, what I just said about the lack of urgency and how privilege sometimes invites a lack of urgency, um, hold me accountable because uh, this is an issue that has not been resolved. And if I seem too comfortable in the amount of time it's taking to resolve it, please uh, speak up and hold me accountable. If you notice other ways in which this place could be more accessible, please bring that to the staff and hold us accountable. I can tell you that we're having conversations about how to make the bathrooms in the cottage more accessible. We are having ongoing conversations on how to transform the religious exploration building to be more accessible. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, um, but it's work that we need to do. So thank you for that question and please keep pressing us on that. Okay, this one's similar to um, what Jamie's addressed before, but I'll read it. How can we make a habit of using our UU values to inform our daily lives? So, I'll lift name a couple of resources um, just to begin with. Uh, the morning meditation meets Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Those meditations are recorded so you can listen to them at any time throughout the day. Um, they are spiritual practices that are grounded in UU values and um, there's check-in afterwards in which people share resources. So that's just one, one, one avenue by which we can support and encourage each other there are chalice circles that we offer every uh, semester. Semester, Those are great ways to connect with people and to hold one another uh, in relationship and to promote UU values. I mean, the thing about making something a habit is that it requires intentionality, right? You have to make it a habit. So I have um, something that changed my life is an app that I bought for my phone. It cost me $5. It's called Streaks. Streaks. And literally all this app does is you put in it the thing that you want to do every day. And if you did that thing 
At the end of a day, you push a button and it goes bing. That's literally all it does. And then it counts the number of times that you did that thing in a row. Um, and that app has transformed my life. And it has helped me stay accountable to a spiritual practice that I have, which is to read wisdom literature every day and reflect on it. Uh, I have a gratitude practice that I do every day. And I have a few other things. Uh, and this little Bing app helps keep me accountable uh, because apparently that's the hack that my brain needed was that little Bing at the end of every day. And the knowledge that if I didn't do the thing, I don't get the Bing. Uh, but your brain may have different hacks than mine. And only you know what your hack is, whether it's uh, post-it notes, whether it's having an accountability partner, whether it's doing thing in a community, uh, whether it's giving yourself a little reward immediately after the, doing the thing, right, whatever it is. Um, I will say there are also, um, there are other resources that, that we can make available, I appreciate this question, to help with that kind of daily practice. I mean, the, the adult religious exploration program um, and the, the religious exploration program in general is committed to the idea that Unitarian Universalism um, be lived throughout our lives, right? And that, that the, the practices come from Sunday into our daily life and into our weeks. Um, so we're always trying to make that easier for people and more accessible. Um, there are resources, there are books of readings, there are websites that send out daily um, uh, prayers and inspirational sayings that, that are directly speak to UU values. Um, so that's a good reminder for me um, for us to continue to publicize those resources and make them as available to you as possible. Uh, I also want to lift up in July, we're starting a monthly accountability group, support group for lack of a better word, specifically related to the environment uh, for people who want to transform how they live lives sustainably in accord with our seventh principle, which is one of our deepest principles. Uh, and I invite you to attend that and people can get together and encourage each other to live more sustainable lives. We have two questions in the chat, and then I think that we're about coming up on the hour, so at that point we will probably be done. So the first question is, what is the UU view of death and immortality? And the answer to that is there is not a single Unitarian Universalist view on death and immortality. Uh, we're a theologically diverse community. People come from all sorts of different perspectives, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, pagan, agnostic, atheist, and uh, other traditions. Um, I would say that Unitarian Universalism in general um, tends to approach death and what lies beyond as a great mystery and as a great source of wonder in our lives. Uh, as a religious tradition, we are very focused on um, what Forest Church called life before death rather than life after death. And the tradition is much more engaged with how do we create meaning and value in our lives now? And how do we live out love and kindness now? And when we talk about heaven and hell, how are we making hell for each other now here on this earth? And how can we transform that into beloved community? So these are the much more active questions that uh, our religious tradition grapples with. Um, our universalist tradition uh, holds out hope, belief, faith in uh, many different ways that when we die, we return to love and we are embraced by love. So that is one path of our tradition. Uh, other paths of our tradition, again, just when we die, that is the mystery and we don't know what lies beyond. Uh, earlier in the year, I preached about reincarnation, which is somewhat tangential to Unitarian Universalism as a main body, but which people increasingly have a lot of curiosity about. Um, in terms of immortality, this is a tradition that focuses mostly on the ways in which the love that we live now endures beyond our life, right? So we're, we're aware, uh, we cherish the fact that love poured out into the world 
is transformative and it's catalytic and love begets more love and kindness begets more kindness. So when we talk about the life that we lead after we die, that is a life that is lived in all of the people around us and all of the lives that we have touched, right? So you carry forward the love that has supported you and nurtured your life and touched you and all of the love that has been directed to you from the people around you, living and dead, you carry that forward. And then the love that you carry forward touches others. And so to the, ex to the extent that we speak affirmatively of immortality, we talk about the immortality of love and the love that endures through all of the choices that we make uh, to lean into it and, and to be generous in the love that we pour out into the world. Okay, this is a long question. Okay, what, are the, what is the general UU position on the idea of the use of closed cultural practices within our pantheism, humanism, multi-religious living tradition? Closed cultural practices meaning those that are passed down among members of one cultural group that are not open to be used by others. An example might be smudging rituals. Okay, so I understand this to be a question about cultural appropriation. Um, what is the UU position on cultural appropriation or the use of rituals in our services that are not intended to be appropriated for general use outside of their context? Um, so this is a, a challenging question. I would say that cultural appropriation is something that Unitarian Universalists and Unitarian Universalist ministers in particular uh, are increasingly aware of. I can tell you that as a Unitarian Universalist minister, I am in a covenant with other UU ministers, and part of our covenant is not to culturally appropriate, and we are held accountable to that, and we hold one another accountable to that. Now, what that means is something that we all have to kind of work out together, and not everyone agrees on that, right? What is cultural sharing? What is cultural celebration? What is cultural appropriation? That's a tough question, and nobody has a perfect answer to it, uh, and it's a kind of a lived into practice. But uh, affirmatively, I am held accountable not to culturally appropriate. And so this has been a growing edge for Unitarian Universalists because um, one of our sources is wisdom of, from the world's religious traditions. And we think of ourselves as a syncretic religion, as a religion that draws from many, many different sources. And we delight in the wisdom of other traditions. Uh, appropriation is primarily about being in relationship. So, um, for example, once upon a time, many UU congregations would hold Day of the Dead services as a way of celebrating that tradition, um, not certainly with any um, bad intent or harmful intent, coming from a place of wanting to lift up other traditions and honor them. And our understanding now is that that would be inappropriate unless that ritual were both brought to me by a Mexican person, someone from that cultural tradition or Mexican-American, and led by someone who was Mexican-American, for whom this was an authentic expression of their lived religious faith, right? It's not something that I would just say, oh, that's wonderful, I'm going to take it and we're going to do it. We're going to decontextualize it. Um, we're going to make it our own, right? It's all about relationship. So if I were going to do a ritual like a Day of the Dead service, first of all, I wouldn't do it. And to the extent that it would happen, it would happen as a product of relationship, not as a product of taking, even if that taking comes from a place of appreciation or curiosity or whatever it is. So again, I appreciate the question. Um, this is something that, again, I am held accountable to, and this is something that I invite you to hold me and the staff and the worship team accountable to as well. So if something happens here uh, and it raises that question for you, please ask me and let's have that conversation. It's something that we take, uh, we take seriously and we do our best to live into, and it's challenging. And there was a question about kind of like numbers, right? How many churches and... How many UUs are in this congregation, in our state, 
in the US, USA and in the world. <laughs> All right, so numbers. Uh, how many UUs are in this congregation? We have, as of now, about 210-ish uh, members, people who have signed the membership book. We have another about 60 people who have the designation friends. Friends are either um, partners of people who are members or people who have made a pledge to the church but are not joined the book for whatever reason, signed the book for whatever reason. So that's about 260, 270. And then there are another probably 50 to 70 people that are in relationship to the congregation but are not yet friends or members. Uh, on any given Sunday between here and Zoom, there's somewhere between 120 and 150 people worshiping together. So those are the UUI numbers. And this is a reasonably stable place for where this has, congregation has been throughout its history. UUI's total membership usually fluctuates somewhere between 200 and about 250, 270, right? So we're kind of at a pretty normal place. Uh, in Indiana, I'm going to have to guess here. You're challenging me for just Indiana. I'm going to guess if I sort of add up the different churches in my head, um, maybe two to 3,000 Unitarians who are officially members of churches. Uh, statistically speaking, about one in 500 to one in 1,000 Americans identify as Unitarian Universalist, depending on how you want to say what that is. So for Indiana, I think there's, what, 6 million people in the state of Indiana, something like that. So that would be maybe 6,000 UUs if you wanted to count very generously. Uh, we are a, a small but vigorous people. Um, but if you added them all up, probably for church membership, somewhere between two and 3,000, if I had to guess. Um, in the country, there are about 160,000 members of about 1,000 UU churches and probably 500,000, again, if you counted every person who identifies as being UU, but maybe doesn't belong to a church. Um, and in the world, uh, that number is not a lot larger. The vast majority of UUs are in North America. There are UU congregations in Canada, in Britain, uh, in India, in uh, Transylvania, in Africa, in Uganda, and a couple of other places in Africa. Um, so we are represented throughout the world, but the great majority of UUs are here in America. Okay. And we are at... What time is it? Oh, my gosh. It's 12.06, so it's time to wrap this up so you all can enjoy this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. So won't you take a breath with me? Breathing in, breathing out. Let us be grateful for our liberal religious tradition, which challenges us to keep questioning, keep searching, keep listening, keep growing. We say that ours is a living tradition. We say that new truth is always breaking into the world. We celebrate curiosity. We celebrate questioning. May love hold you and keep you this Memorial Day weekend. May it be filled with beautiful conversations, beautiful questions, and maybe even one or two answers. <laughs>